Thank you. I'll uh, just put my phone on to count down from three and a half hours. So. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I'll just put that up there to show that I have already moved my armchair expertise onto nuclear submarines. So that's a volume we put out late last year, um, examining this, this long journey uh, into the future. So I am a qualified armchair expert. So first of all, thank you to Tony and Saab. Thank you to uh, Olivia and the events team and our awesome interns. Uh, thank you also to Steve Clark, our publications manager. And also thank you to this guy, Dr. Ben Stevens, uh, ASPE research intern who wrote chapter six, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, this morning he called in to say he was a COVID close contact, so <laughs> he can't come to his own party. But uh, but Ben wrote a chapter on on the Ukraine. So previous reports have studied the cost of defence, but we've never really looked at the cost of war. And so we thought this year it was time to do so. And so Ben's done a fantastic job looking at the ripple effects of outwards from the war in Ukraine. And the bottom line is, if you think the cost of defence is a lot, the cost of war is many, many times more. OK, so at the end of March, the previous government released its 2022-23 budget. The new government has indicated it will release a, a budget in October, but for now, the last budget is the one we have, and so we'll start there. So once again, the coalition government delivered the funding it set out uh, in the 2016 Defence White Paper and the 2020 Defence uh, Strategic Update. The Consolidated Defence Appropriation, so that is the Department of Defence combined with the Australian Signals Directorate, is $48.6 billion. That's a substantial nominal increase of 7.4% and a real increase of 3.8%. Though I will stress that uh, the size of any real increase is tied to inflation and as we all know inflation is running very hot at the moment so any assessment of real increases uh, will be pretty unreliable at the moment. Okay, I think it's important to acknowledge that the previous government uh, delivered exactly what it said it was going to do in terms of defence funding. The bottom line is that there's been 10 years of uh, real increases. I'll just... So the, the red lines are the defence budget, that's history, that's the forward estimates from the budget documents, and that's the remainder of the defence strategic updates funding line. The blue line is 2% of GDP, and what we can see is from here on in, the defence budget grows quite significantly past GDP, noting that you know, nothing is carved in stone in terms of GDP. So there's been 10 years of real funding increases, but just as important as the amount itself has been the consistency. It set out a fixed line of funding in the 2016 white paper and has delivered that virtually to the exact dollar, even during the pandemic. And as many of us who have worked in this space know that sticking to the funding plan is crucial. If you're trying to deliver capability, dramatic ups and downs in the funding line are very hard to manage. That said, <coughs> excuse me, we can argue about what that should be spent on and how well it's being spent. And indeed, some of you might know that I've offered my views on the good, the bad and the ugly in uh, the defence spending space. But there's no doubt that ADF capability is improving. Chapter four of the report offers a review of how the capability program is going. I'll talk a little more about capability uh, challenges uh, later on, but first I wanna highlight the impact of that sustained spending on uh, Australian defence industry. Oops. Uh, okay, so this is data that defence gives us every year that breaks down local acquisition and sustainment spending compared to overseas acquisition and sustainment spending. And I've said before that Australian defence industry will need to eat an elephant to digest its share of the growing acquisition and sustainment budgets. The local combined sustainment and acquisition spend could reach somewhere near $25 billion by the end of this decade. So it's a huge ask. But so far, Australian industry is showing it has real appetite to do so. 
So we can see in the, in the blue columns that's the absolute spend in terms of dollars. So last year it passed uh, over $3.5 billion just on local acquisition spending. The number's a bit low this coming year, but that's because it doesn't include approved projects. I think by the time we get to the end of the year, that number will, will go up. But the other, the really, I think, interesting thing is, is that the Australian spend is growing as a share of the total spend. So um, for a long time, we had a lot of trouble getting past about 30%, but for the last couple of years, Australian industry has hit 40%. So. So um, I think what that shows is that when it's presented with clear, consistent demand signals, Australian defence industry can respond. You know, so you know I, I wouldn't give up hope that we can hit that $25 billion local spend by the end of the decade. And I'd also note that all of defence's acquisition programs, equipment, facilities and ICT, have been setting spending records over the last few years. You know, the name of the game is to get money out the door and defence has been doing it. Even during the pandemic when supply chains were suffering serious disruptions. And I think that's something that defence and its industry partners should get a lot of credit for. So uh, let's take a, a quick look at the big three. So the big three is the balance of funding between the three big pots of money. So people, acquisition and operating. And when we talk about defence, operating essentially is the sustainment budget. If we go back to the white paper and the defence strategic update, the big winner was the acquisition budget. So that, that's the blue line. So traditionally, uh, you know, the acquisition budget has averaged around about 25% of the total budget. Okay, it's been the poor cousin of the three. People uh, have averaged uh, much more, sort of around about 35 or to 40%, okay. But <clears throat> the narrative out of the white paper is that acquisition was meant to grow from about a long-term average of 25% up to about 40% of the budget. Personnel spending was meant to be the opposite. It would have dropped from around 40% down to about 25%. Now, uh, acquisition spending has grown a lot and personnel spending has fallen as a percentage, but not quite to the extent predicted. So what we're seeing is those trajectories are kind of flattening out. So I think acquisition will probably flatten out at around 20, uh, sorry, 35% and uh, people will flatten out around about 30%. You know? I think what we're really seeing there is there are certain natural limits around that, that balance. Okay, the, you, you can't just go and buy stuff. You know, if you want to be able to use it, you need to keep spending money on sustainment and people. So, you know, I think we've sort of reached, we're about as kind of ambitious as we can be in terms of acquisition spending, unless you want stuff just sitting around doing nothing. Okay, and so in a nutshell, that's where we got to with the, the previous government's last budget. As you know, we now have a new government. So let's look at the issues it will face around uh, defence spending. Well, I think the first big question is the defence funding line. So the government uh, in opposition said it supported the current level of funding and specifically said it supported the $270 billion investment program. But of course, it's also inherited significant levels of debt and continuing budget deficits, a rapidly rising cost of living pressure on the Australian public, and of course, uh, just recently, the quote, perfect storm of energy costs and availability. I just make a little digression on energy. So we learned during the COVID-19 pandemic about the perils of relying on global markets for key items and commodities. And the defence strategic update was, in a sense, the defence supply chain white paper. As a result, we are spending billions to promote Australian defence industry, including uh, establishing a sovereign guided weapons industry so we can make the weapons we need here, particularly in time of crisis. Yet, we still subject ourselves to the whims of the international energy market and let it control the price and availability of our own gas and coal resources. But surely energy security is a key element of national security. So why don't we reserve a small part of our gas production for our own consumers? 
how does it make sense to foster Australian defence industry when we are putting Australia's entire manufacturing sector at risk? The argument seems to be that the world won't see Australia as a reliable supplier if we reserve some of Australia's gas for Australians. Yet Western Australia reserved 15% of its gas and the world is still lining up to buy the remaining 85%. And West Australian consumers have affordable gas. I'll give you an analogy. It's like us setting up a local production line for guided weapons. Hmm, who would do that? But when a war starts, the ADF has no privileged access to those weapons and has to outbid any other defence force that wants them. So I, I really don't get our energy policy. And I will also say another little pet sideline, that probably the single best thing we can do to enhance Australia's security is to electrify everything as fast as possible and accelerate the transition to renewables. I mean, Xi Jinping cannot turn off the sun or stop the wind. <laughs> but I digress. Sorry, my pet hobby horse. I'll get back to my original point, is that there will be intense competition for tax dollars. The while the, the new government has supported the previous government's funding, it's also referred to 2% of GDP being the defence budget. Now, I'm not saying the government will cut the budget, but I think it's important for us to understand what st sticking strictly to 2% of GDP means. Okay. So when we look at the DSU funding line, as I've pointed out, it goes well past 2% of GDP. Okay. Okay. So, and Defence has already planned to spend every single cent of that. That money is already spoken for. So we might think that going from 2.1, 2.2% of GDP back down to 2% isn't much of a reduction. But in dollar terms, it's a very, very large cut. I'm afraid you probably can't see it up the back, but that's the difference. And the difference in the next couple of years is three to $4 billion a year. Okay. Now, if GDP doesn't grow as expected, that number will get a lot bigger very quickly. I did the same exercise two years ago, peak of the pandemic. Pandemic. The difference was in the eight to nine billion dollar range. Okay. So, well, what does what does three to four billion mean? So, if we if defence lost three to four billion, what does that mean? Well, to give a sense, defence's top ten sustainment products, so its ten most expensive capabilities this year, are costing three point four billion dollars. Okay. So that's the top 10. OK, so it's equivalent to parking our submarines, our destroyers, our frigates, F-35, Super Hornets, Growlers, Wedgetail, MRH-90, but we're doing that anyway, don't worry, P-8s, and also notting the Army or Navy fire a bullet, shell or missile. OK, so that's the impact of sticking strictly to 2% of GDP. OK. So, we do have to accept there will be stiff competition for tax dollars, but I think there is still good reason to increase the defence budget. The first is that the current funding line was generated in 2015 as part of the development of the 2016 White Paper. Okay, so as we've seen, there are real increases built into that, that line, but it's still the same set of numbers that were generated six or seven years ago. And I don't need to outline the way in which our security situation has changed in those six or seven years. If we thought a long-term number of around 2.2 to 2.3% of GDP was the right number before the CCP annexed the South China Sea and sent PLA assets regularly into our immediate region, before Putin reminded us that war is still a thing, and before we learned that you need to spend money to address supply chain risks, then that percentage is probably insufficient for our current circumstances. Um, people go, well, what number? I don't know. It's like, I don't have the answer. Michael will tell you the answers, OK? So. More than what it is. OK, another reason it, an increase is needed is that it's not at all clear to me that the existing funding line is sufficient to acquire and operate the plan for structure. I think there is a misalignment already between dollars and ambition. Okay, these are some of the uh, 
pressures on the defence budget. First of all, there is inflation, which I'll talk about. There are very, very significant new capabilities in there, and some of them are very large, you know, like multiple tens of billions of dollars, such as ballistic missile defence. Many of the existing capabilities are being replaced by much larger ones, so the future Navy will be essentially twice the tonnage of the Navy it's replacing. We have a history of underestimating costs quite significantly, at least in the journey up to second pass. We're quite good after second pass, but up to second pass things can move. So and the future frigate has grown from 30 billion to 45 billion. We have growing contractor workforce, which I'll talk about later. And of course, SSNs are gonna cost a lot more than the attack class. So I couldn't see all of that fitting in even before the cancellation of the attack class. Now it definitely won't. Okay. Okay, so I'll just talk about some of those pressures. So the first one is inflation. Here I've just sort of mapped out a few different scenarios of inflation trajectory. So that's where we were last year. The blue line was the forecast for last year. Already just using the budget documents, predictions for uh, inflation, there's already quite a significant gap. So in 22-23, defence, I think, has probably lost about $1.5 billion in, in buying power just there. If inflation, this uh, green line is inflation, stays at around 5% through the forward estimates, and you can see that per year, you know, defence is already losing sort of six, seven, eight billion dollars a year in buying power. If inflation stays at five percent, God forbid, out to the end of the decade, then that gap, you know, starts to look more like, you know, sort of 13, 14 billion dollars a year. Okay, so inflation is also a thing again. And I would suggest that as an immediate measure, it would make sense for the government to compensate defence for lost buying power until the government gets its head around the long-term funding picture. OK, and one of my favourite topics, workforce. So the new government is going to have to grapple with uh, defence's workforce challenges. And I think there's, there's two main ones that I want to talk about. The first one is contractor workforce. Now, um, Defence's external workforce has continued to grow and it uh, has increased its lead over Army and so its lead as the largest service is getting bigger and bigger. That in itself is not a problem in my view. What the, the key issue is is that um, a subset of that external workforce, so contractors, uh, is growing extremely rapidly. Again, apologies, you probably can't see it, but contractors have grown over the last three years from about 4,600 to 8,300. So that's a 78% growth in contractor numbers just in the last three years. Um, now, there's no way Defence could have spent all of those acquisition dollars without using contractors, okay? So I'm not saying they don't make a very valuable contribution. But the reason Defence is using contractors, one reason is it can't hire public servants. And um, you know, by my very rough back of the beer coaster calculation, Defence is spending over $1 billion a year more to use contractors than public servants. That's coming out of acquisition and sustainment budgets. Now, I say it's possible that it could be a billion, but no, who really knows? You know, the old saying goes, what gets measured gets managed. And I've seen no evidence to indicate that it is actually being measured. And I'm sure there are many cases where contractors offer value for money. The problem at the moment is that Defence is using them because they're the only option, not the best option. The second part of the people problem, people issue, is ADF numbers. Okay, when you add up the additional people set out first in the white paper, in the Defence strategic update, and the recent announcement of many thousands more people that the previous government made, the ADF needs to grow by around 18,000 over the next two decades, with most of it in the first decade. Unfortunately, uh, the ADF has only averaged around 300 net growth over the last six years. It's 300 per year over the last six years. So uh, you do the math and at that rate, it's gonna take 60 years to get there. So, but those people, you know, those people are needed. So Defence has mapped people to capabilities. It needs those people to operate the capabilities in its investment plan. So if you can't operate those capabilities for 60 years, doesn't make sense in buying them. 
You know, so I think at the very least, you know, we need to be investigating force structures and capabilities that don't require such large increases. Otherwise, again, we have a misalignment between people and, and investment. OK, and so I'll move on to capability challenges. And there are many to talk about. I'll just focus on one in particular. So, uh, so ADF capability is increasing. But the question is, is it increasing at the rate we need in our current circumstances where the defence strategic update said we no longer have warning time? You know, I find it quite remarkable that the ADF still doesn't have any armed drones of any kind. Nor does it seem to have a plan to get any. I mean, there's, there's some talk that Ghost Bat might be armed at some point down the track, but um, I don't see any clear plan. Now, there are some very encouraging signs that defence is putting more effort into the quotes, the small, the smart and the many. That is, affordable, attritable, autonomous systems that can be designed rapidly, built rapidly, lost and replaced rapidly. But the investment program is still dominated by the mega projects. So mega projects take years to deliver, tie up huge amounts of cash, and when they go wrong, they go badly wrong. Okay? And the one number that people always ask me about is, what's the sunk cost of the attack loss? So let's rip the Band-Aid off. I'll just talk about it now. So there is a figure of 5.5 billion that's been floating around in the media. That's not the right number. Um, by, by my count, sorry, we've lost some of the formatting here, unfortunately. That's the spend to the 30th of June this year. Okay, there are termination costs, which defence officials at Senate estimates have said can be covered by the remaining next year's, this coming year's budget, which is 425 million. They say they've started negotiations and are confident that that will fall within that. Earlier phases before we selected the attack class are another 205 million, and expenditure on the shipyard to date is 470 million, but we don't exactly know how much of that can be reused. And there's some talk that we will actually need a completely different shipyard to build SSN. So, so add all of that up, and it's somewhere less than four billion three hundred ten million. So, <clears throat> so when Mega projects go bad, they tend to go really bad. Okay, and that's the segue to talk about submarines. So, so like I said, lots of capability areas to talk about, but submarines are always the favorite. So we are facing a very long submarine transition. The previous government said that we'd get the first SSNs around 2038. The new defense minister has said that that's unlikely. Either way, by the time we have an actual capability of maybe three to four usable boats, we will be deep into the 2040s. Okay. Now, defence has said there won't be a capability gap. But it's important to understand what defence means when it says there won't be a capability gap. So this, this slide shows the current submarine requirement. So essentially, out of a fleet of six, four are in service but two of them are deployable. So you get two from six. Okay. And that's actually world best benchmark, world's best practice, okay? One three to one ratio. So defence has two that are deployable, and that's the Navy's requirement. But that's all the capability it can provide. It can't suddenly create provide more than that. So there's this really strange circular argument. The requirement is to provide what it can actually best case provide. So it's actually got nothing to do with the capability we need. And I'd also note that with two boats available, there's no way to keep one on station at any distance from Australia. With transit times, you know, it cannot, cannot be done. And that's the capability we'll have over the long transition to the SSN fleet. Sure, the boats will be upgraded and be put through a life of type extension, assuming nothing goes wrong in that very, very extensive program of works. But there will still only be six boats which will be well into their 40s when they're retired. I'd also note that the defence budget will hit $100 billion per year sometime in the mid-2030s. So for $100 billion, we get two deployable 30-year-old boats. That's what defence means by we won't have a capability gap. And I'd, 
I'd also note that we have a similar, but maybe not quite as dire situation with the frigate fleet. So to paraphrase Oscar Wilde, to embark on a highly risky transition with one of your combat fleets is a misfortune. To do it with both simultaneously looks like carelessness. So if we cast our minds back to the 2009 white paper, that was the first strategic document that said our circumstances required us to increase our submarine capability. That document said the answer was 12 conventional submarines. Since then, the answer has changed, but no government has diverged from the basic assessment that we need more submarine capability. But even though the 2016 White Paper said our strategic circumstances had become more dangerous, and the 2020 Defence Strategic Update said that that was occurring faster than we expected and we no longer have warning time, and then last year we created AUKUS because of our deteriorating security environment, Despite all of that, we are still not getting any new submarine capability before the late 2030s, and that could be optimistic. We will still have the same capability 30 years after we started this journey in the 2009 white paper. It's like realising on the eve of the First World War you need more capability, but not actually getting it until after the end of the Second World War. So there's really no other way to look at it than we already have a capability gap. And that gap is going to endure for potentially another 20 years under Defence's current plan. OK, so does that mean we should rush out and buy some kind of interim submarine? Well, I'm sure, you know, Tony could give us a, a very, very nice submarine. One might ask why we didn't just do that in the first place, but hindsight is 2020. I think the first thing we should do is get therapy for our collective submarine fetish that makes us think that throwing huge amounts of money at getting the perfect submarine sometime in the distant future will keep us safe. I also think that the new Defence Minister is right in saying we need to look at all options. That could include another conventional submarine. However, unless we ruthlessly manage our capability requirements, we risk going down the attack class path again. If we want an interim submarine quickly, it won't be the world's biggest, most capable conventional submarine. It will be something very different from the Navy's desire. But we also need to be looking across the spectrum of complementary capabilities. From the high end, such as the B-21 bomber, which we've written about before, to accelerated investment in the small, the smart and the many. Here's one of my favourite little non-killer drones. It's, an Ellis, it's photos of the Australian company Oceus's Blue Bottle uncrewed surface vessels. And um, that's them in action. Sorry, my mistake. That's them uh, essentially conducting around-the-clock surveillance off Ashmore Reef and essentially clearing out all of the illegal fishes in Ashmore Reef. So they exist. They're already doing their job. Uh, sorry, and the bottom right picture is uh, a test that they're doing with Talus on putting Talus's total ray sonars on them so they can do a similar job for underwater surveillance. You know, and I will highlight that the Navy, you know, I, I've been bashing up Navy, but Navy is investing in autonomous underwater vessels, and so there are multiple lines of effort going on in Navy to explore the small, the smart, and the many, you know, and so that is happening. Now, Mike, Michael and I have spent the last four and a half years writing about this, so I'm not going to keep banging on uh, about it because you've heard it all before. But I would say that as a matter of urgency, the government should consider options to install actual warfighting capability on our offshore patrol vessels, which will start to be delivered this year and not sometime in the 2030s. You know, work with the ship you've got. I'd also note the government will soon be asked to make a decision on the 18 to $27 billion infantry fighting vehicle. Well, I don't want to start World War III about tanks and armour. All I'll say is this is another mega project. And before making a decision to tie up the last big uncommitted pot of cash in the capability program, the government should make very sure that this acquisition is consistent with what it thinks the ADF should be doing. And one final remark uh, on transparency and accountability. 
Overall, as we've seen, the government has got its work cut out for it in the defence space. Uh, but whatever path it chooses, it will need to bring the Australian public along on the journey. We are six further election cycles away from our first SSM. Under the previous government, we reached the nadir of communication between the government, the parliament and defence, and we simply can't afford for that to continue. Under its transparency agenda, the new government has the opportunity to reset the conversation about the defence budget, what it is being spent on and how well it's being spent. That will require a commitment to sharing real information. That means accepting the risk that bad news will get out along with the good. But an informed public is fundamental to democracy. Thank you.